Does everything still look okay with my screen? Yep. Yeah, okay. I lost the, normally it has a green border around it and it's gone now, so. No, it looks sure. good. I'm going to be a host this evening. Uh, so, before we dive into uh, this, uh, it, we are going to take this to 40 minutes plus time for questions at the end. Um, and there's a lot of info in this right from the internet, so we'll go to the extra. So uh, if you have questions as we go, please feel free to add them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will ask them questions at the end. As I said, try to get to as many as we can. If there's something that we don't get to today, we will follow up with an email to everybody. It will also be sent out a recording of this webinar afterwards. So if you miss anything or you need to relive the fun, it will be right there in your inbox for you. Um, and if you have any questions that we can't get to today, please feel free to reach out to us at um, adventure at wildwomenexpeditions.com and we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, so to start us off, I am happy to start with some intros of our wonderful panel this evening. So I'm actually going to ask everybody to do a little intro. Maybe tell us a little something about your experience in the Arctic. So we'll start with our Wild Women Expedition so, Franny. Hello, everybody. I'm Franny Bergschneider, and I work uh, I work with Wild Women Expeditions as the program and operations manager. Um, I have previous a lot of previous extensive Arctic um, exploration under my belt. I worked as an expedition guide up there for uh, several years, and um, 
last season was my first season adventuring to the Arctic with Adventure Canada and Wild Women. Uh, and I had the privilege of actually going on this particular trip, the high Arctic um, trip that we're talking about this evening. And it's one of my favorite landscapes. Um, it's just stunning. The light is beautiful, the wildlife and the people bring it all together. Thank you, Julianne. Also, some of you may have spoken to Julianne on the phone. Julianne, tell us about you. Yeah, I think I spoke to several women today. Actually, I already did speak to several women about the Arctic today. Um, yeah, so I'm a Wild Women's Adventure Specialist. Um, so yeah, I do talk to a lot of women on the telephone, but I also get to go on uh, the occasional Awesome Wild Women trip. And I was on the Ocean Endeavor last fall on the Greenland Wild Labrador trip, which was absolutely incredible. Um, I don't have as much experience as Franny up there, but um, I would, yeah, yeah, it was absolutely stunning and I cannot wait to get back up there. It's just an incredible landscape and um, was lucky enough to go to Antarctica on the Ocean Endeavor as well, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great boat. I love the size of it. I love the whole kind of family feel with Adventure Canada and with the Wild Women group on there as well. It's just a really small kind of personable great amount of people that are on there it's not like your giant ship trips but um yeah I don't have enough good things to say about um traveling in the arctic with Adventure Canada and Wild Women so yeah excellent thanks Julianne um Lauren this is Lauren from Adventure Canada Hi, yeah, I'm Lauren. I am the group coordinator here at Adventure Canada. So that means once you've booked through Wild Women, uh, I actually book you in our system and get everything ready to go behind the scenes. Um, I only joined Adventure Canada back in 2020. And because of many uh, pandemic related things, uh, last season was my very first season actually getting on board the Ocean Endeavor. And I also was on this particular uh, program last season. And it was my first trip, first time to uh, the Arctic and absolutely blew my mind the entire time. I loved it so, so much. And I'm very happy to say that I'm going to be on this trip again this summer. So I'm going to be back up into the Arctic. I could not be more excited. It's just the most beautiful place on earth. It's difficult to describe. You just have to, to go there. <laughs> Thanks. And Brenna, also from Adventure Canada. Yeah, yeah, thank you. My name is Brenna Green. I am the junior sales lead here at Adventure Canada, and I also work on the ship from time to time as a, a mixture of roles, program director, sales, expedition team. Uh, we all wear a lot of different hats here at Adventure Canada. Uh, last season, I did 100 days on board, so I'm very, very familiar with the Ocean Endeavour. Um, and I think I've completed about 18 or so expeditions in general with Adventure Canada. Um, and the High Arctic, I did twice last season because it runs um, in two different routes. And then I also did it in 2019. So I've experienced this particular itinerary that we're going to talk about today uh, three times. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to do just a quick intro on wild women expeditions as well. So um, I know many people on this call have traveled with us multiple times before and some might be new. So just a huge welcome to everybody on this call and our huge community here. Um, some people, this might be obvious, people might know, but it's worth sharing that we are proud to be a woman, a woman founded, woman owned and women led business. We've been in the business for over 30 years and we offer trips on all seven continents very exciting. Um, we are focused on sharing amazing experiences um, out in nature. So we always want to have some interaction in wildlife, just feel the open spaces and be able to be together with our community of women in open natural wild spaces and really um, experiencing that wildness. So um, a lot of our women do travel solo, um, but we also have women that are traveling with friends or with partners. And the most magical part of our trips is sharing the experience with other women and so that's what brings our community together and why sharing these incredible experiences all over the world is really special and we've seen groups of women become lifelong friends 
travel together time and again. Um, we love hearing stories of women challenging themselves and pushing themselves and doing it with a group of women. So like literally climbing mountains and achieving Everest Base Camp or jumping into the Arctic waters while people are cheering each other on. It's a, it's a really special way to share these experiences and why Wild Women Expeditions is so special. Um, and everywhere we want to run our trips around the world, we work with local guides and companies uh, to partner with who align with our ethos and sustainability. Um, and this is where um, Adventure Canada comes in. Uh, we really want to make sure that we're working with partners who align with our ethos of sustainability and giving back to um, the planet and caring about the communities we visit. Uh, so we're really careful with who we partner with and the kind of experiences and adventures that we want to share in these places. And so when we chose to work with Adventure Canada, it's because they are the experts in the region, and we're going to hear more about that this evening, which is great. And that means that the trips aren't just a fun adventure, which of course they are. Fun is a huge part of what we do, um, but also educational experience to learn about the Indigenous cultures that we visit along the way, learning a lot about the wildlife and the nature, um, the effect of climate change as it has in the North is a huge part of what we'll get to see. So it's really an all-encompassing experience that we get to take in and that's why we're so excited to partner with them and to have our group of women of our community that's you sharing it on the ship um, and sharing these experiences with each other I think is what makes it so so special um, and Brenna has met some of our has been on trips with our wild women and uh, so Brenna take it away awesome thank you so much yeah, so I have traveled with Wild Women quite a few times now. Um, this was on the High Arctic Explorer last season. So there's Franny and I out on the back deck. Um, this was such a spectacular trip. And I've been with the Wild Women in Antarctica, Greenland, Labrador. Um, so I've had lots of experience with that group on board. And it's such a fun time. Uh, like Megan said, our our values really align and it makes for a really magical experience having all these ladies on board. It's a, a ton of fun. So the way I want to start this, this presentation out was with a quick video because um, like they say an image says a thousand words. So I think that showing this video really gives a really um, clear view of, of what Adventure Canada is actually trying to do on these expeditions. So I'm just going to get that video up on the screen. It's about um, three minutes long. Enjoy. Founded in 1987, Adventure Canada is a family-run travel company specializing in small ship expedition cruises to the world's most beautiful and seldom visited coastlines. Whether that's exploring beautiful and rugged Arctic waterways where Inuit have called home for generations, journeying to uninhabited European isles that are only accessible by ship, or kicking up a jig at kitchen parties in remote Atlantic fishing villages, you can always expect the same great travel experience wherever you journey with us. Our pioneering approach emphasizes wildlife, culture, learning, and fun in small group experiences. You'll get close to nature, immerse yourself in culture, see stunning vistas, and experience the joy of being out on the water. The uh, education level is just phenomenal and, and the experience, the combined experience of the team is just phenomenal. And uh, you know, having been to uh, the Arctic before, but not this particular part of it, I, in, in two weeks I've just learned so much and, and it's fascinating. You'll travel alongside some of the most renowned experts in the field, making lifelong memories as you go. Join an archaeologist on a visit to fascinating historical sites, a glaciologist on a zodiac cruise around massive icebergs, a cultural educator at a hands-on art workshop, or simply enjoy a meal with any of our friendly and approachable expedition team members. Each day, you can choose the activity you like best, whether that's a strenuous hike up to a lookout, a guided photography walk along the shore, or wildlife spotting out on deck. There's truly something for everyone. Through these transformative experiences, we believe travel can act as a force for positive change in the world. Imagine a planet with a healthy climate, healthy environments, healthy cultures, and healthy communities. 
to make this vision a reality, we've committed to becoming carbon neutral, to achieving net zero waste operations, to giving back 30% of our corporate giving towards cultural preservation and revitalization projects as part of our regenerative travel plan. Through travel, we are also building equitable employment opportunities and growing local businesses. When you join us, you can feel confident that you're giving back as much to these special places as you gain from them. There's one simple hearing hack. And we don't need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that settled? Perfect. Oh my goodness. You know, get off this video slide. <laughs> Perfect. So first I just wanted to talk a little bit about our ship. So we travel on the Ocean Endeavor. We just have the, the one ship in our fleet that we charter. And our ship is not fancy. We are a very casual company. It's really our method of travel to get to these very remote places. So we take a maximum of 198 guests on board with us. And then we have a very large team of experts that come on board as well that I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, but our ship does have a pool and a hot tub and, and um, a spa, and it has all those comforts that you need. Uh, but she is small. She has uh, one, one restaurant. Lots of deck space really is the important part of this ship. Um, the Ocean Endeavor has tons of deck space, lots of opportunity to be outside looking for wildlife, which is exactly what we want to be doing. Um, but like I said, she's not fancy. She is just the, the way that we get to these very remote places. She is ice class, so we are able to navigate around um, some ice. She's not an icebreaker, uh, but she is able to navigate around ice, bump into it, which is a really fun experience, getting in the bow of the ship and, and hearing the ice hit um, with the brash ice all around. It's um, a really special experience. So I, I'm, I love the Ocean Endeavor personally. And she's also how we get into these communities. So a lot of the communities that we go into on this trip are just very, very difficult to get to any other way. Um, and she is small enough to get close to those towns, we take our zodiacs from there um, in order to access those places. Uh, so we, we do use zodiacs every single day on our voyages, and we just use these gangways that you can see in the photo to board them. We have about 20 zodiacs on board, and your drivers are your expedition team. So the zodiacs really provide a lot of opportunity for interpretation. They're not just a, a way to get to land. We'll use them uh, to cruise around and, and enjoy them rather than and just using them to get to land. And they're really nothing to be scared of. Uh, the zodiacs are super easy to board. Your team will be there with you, holding you the entire way. You can see here they're using the sailor's grip off of the gangway to get get in um, and, and no one will let go of you until you're seated. Um, so they're very, very safe, very sturdy. Um, and once you're in there, you'll be happy as can be with your um, expedition guide there driving you. And they give us access to experiences like this. We'll go cruising around the ice. Uh, we'll take them into communities. We'll take them for our uh, landings to go hiking but they provide really unique experiences that you just can't get any other way. Uh, like I said, the staff will be there to interpret things for you. We'll pull ice out of the water and talk about the different formations and what the colors mean. Hopefully we'll also get some experiences like this with polar bears. Um, exploring the ice in the zodiacs is the best way to see polar bears. Uh, we'll go out exploring in uh, God, just these beautiful destinations where it's just a bunch of ice and you have no idea what to expect. And that's all part of that adventure element of expedition travel. We'll hop in the boats, go looking through the ice and who knows what we'll find. Um, but hopefully we'll see some polar bears. And getting off at land, same thing. You'll have lots of support there. Our team will make sure that you're taken care of the whole way. Um, if you need a hand getting out of the boat, they're right there holding on to you until you're uh, safely on ground. 
and then we'll go out for our day um, and 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 experience different hikes and walks and different interpretation. Like the video said, it's really geared towards whatever your interests are that you want to be doing on land. So um, we might do a botany walk that you could sign up for or a photography walk. Or if you're really, really active and you just need to stretch your legs, maybe you'll choose to go out on the uh, 10 kilometer hike with one of the guides. There's lots of different options when we go out on excursions. You can also just choose to have a minute to yourself if you don't want to uh, participate in something with the group and you're wanting to maybe have a moment of mindfulness, really take in where we are in the world because it, it is something that you should find time to reflect on on these trips. Um, that's perfectly okay too. So you really get to design your experience. You can focus in on one interest of yours or a few interests of yours, um, or you can find those, those moments for reflection and do something independent. So the team, exceptional team that we have on board, there's about 25 to 35 experts that are going to be joining you on this expedition and they range um, in disciplines. So we'll have historians, we'll have culturalists on board who are from the places that we're going to. Um, so on the High Arctic Explorer, you'll have Greenlandic staff on board and you'll also have Inuit staff from Nunavut and Nunavik on board. Um, they are historians, they're botanists, they're ornithologists, they're glaciologists. We have a volcanist, I think they're called or something like that. We have all the is on board. Every topic that you could be interested in is really covered with this team and they're so multifaceted. They're driving your zodiacs, they're providing your lectures, they're doing workshops, they're taking you out on hikes, they're eating with you at dinner. Um, they are doing everything all the time, all at once. Uh, they are true superheroes on board. So like I said, they're, they are going to be providing lectures and that is a really big component of our expeditions. So it is all education focused. That is our purpose. We are there to experience this places, but these places, but we're also there to learn about these places and take that knowledge home and be ambassadors for this really special place that we have the privilege of going to. Uh, so your team will be providing lectures about a range of, of topics, depending on what their discipline is. So you can expect that on a daily basis, uh, lectures. And um, like I said, we, we do have our local staff on board um, who will provide different lectures and the Wild Women Group really hone in on that woman element. Um, I really love that about them. It's, it's such a cool topic to be talking about, especially in the North. It's really, really special to get to hear the stories of, of Inuit women in the North. Um, so that's something you can look forward to as well. And then that same team, like I said, they're they're dining with you, they're hiking with you, they're, they're doing everything all at once. They're also your evening entertainment. So um, they, for the most part, all of them, it seems like, have uh, some type of musical talent. I don't know how these people are as incredible as they are. I am just trying to learn the harmonica. Um, hard to do. So these staff will do different things in the evening. We like to dance. Um, we like to play games. We like to talk, do stories, different things. But you can look forward to something every single night. Um, if it's been a really long day, maybe we'll just play a movie. Um, but again, it's going to be uh, locally specific to where we are. So maybe we'll watch Martha of the North, for example. And our culturalist staff on board will also provide a welcome right at the beginning of the expedition, which is a really special spiritual experience. Um, we're very lucky that they do this for us. Um, and, and it really sets off the tone of entering into their, into their home and being welcomed there. So wild women are joining us on quite a few itineraries. So I'm just gonna show you an overview of all of those itineraries that we have the wild women coming on because maybe this has piqued your interest in the Arctic in general or being with wild women in general. Um, so I'll show you all of them and then I'm gonna focus in on that one that we're talking today, which is this one, the Greenland and Arctic Canada, High Arctic Explorer departing on July 25th of this summer. Anna? Yes. Just while you're talking about these, one question did come in. Um, is there anything in the Arctic that's comparable to the Drake Passage? Just while you're talking about these itineraries, mm. maybe you can address mm. some of the, uh, the yeah, being let's, on board and the see open ocean. <laughs> see if I can go backwards here. No, okay, that's okay. Um, there's got to be a way. There we go. Okay, so compar comparable to the Drake Passage, not really. Um, it's 
the only thing that is slightly comparable is the Davis Strait. So that's this body of water here. A little further north, it's referred to as Baffin Bay, but further down, it's Davis Strait. It is not the notorious weather like the Drake, which is why I say not really. Um, we don't really prepare people uh, for the Drake shake type of thing with the with the Davis. It is an open body of water the potential of having rougher weather will be here is in the Davis Strait, but it does not have that notorious um, personality, we'll call it, um, of the Drake Passage. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> For sure. And if you have worries about seasickness, if that's what you're thinking while you're listening to me and you're like, oh my God, you want me to go on a boat to the Arctic? What the heck are you talking about? Talk with these ladies when you're booking your trip and we can make sure we get you in a cabin where seasickness is taken into account. You can be on a lower deck and more central on the ship and things like that to minimize that. So the other itinerary is happening next summer. It's called our Heart of the Arctic, which is a bit further south um, on southern Baffin Island and then heading up to Greenland. And then they'll join us again for Greenland and Arctic Canada again in 2024. So the same itinerary just a year later. And in that same year into the Northwest Passage, which is essentially an extended version of the High Arctic Explorer. This one is 17 days as compared to 12. Um, and that one goes right through the passage into Kugluktuk. Um, so a bit more comprehensive if you are really, really into the explorer history, the European explorer history, and you want to go through uh, the Queen Mode Gulf where the ships went down, um, then maybe you would want to take a look at this itinerary. But again, the experts are here in this room. If you're debating between whether High Arctic or Into the Northwest Passage is right for you, you've got the right group of gals here to, to talk about that with. So focusing in on High Arctic Explorer here, that's the itinerary we really want to dive into to today. And I'm going to cover about five topics here um, that really summarize this itinerary. Um, so visiting the birthplace of icebergs, which is Ilulisat, which I'm going to talk about in a second. You get to channel that inner explorer that we all have. That's why we're here in this room today. We're curious about exploring the world. So going through the Davis Strait, which is... Um, a very important thing to people who are interested in that explorer history um, and the history of the Northwest Passage and Beachy Island, of course, where Franklin's graves are found. We're also going to take a look at the Arctic wildlife that we can expect on this trip and uh, learn a little bit of Talaruti Apamanga, which is a wildlife uh, hot zone, we'll call it. Um, we'll talk about Mitsmatalik, or otherwise known as Pond Inlet, which is an Inuit Canadian community. And then also all of you who are interested as, in getting as far north as possible. I know that we have a few people in this room who went on the Antarctic voyage. Um, we're looking at getting you to 74 degrees north. So we'll talk about that as well. So first, we're going to talk about the birthplace of icebergs, which is Ilulisat. So Ilulisat is on the west coast of Greenland, and it is home to the um, UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Ilulisat Ice Fjord and the Jakobshavn Glacier. Um, this site is um, a hard one to explain without seeing it. It is something that you need to experience. If you like ice, you are going to love Ilulisat. It is one of my favorite stops on all of our itineraries. I've traveled the west coast of Greenland extensively and nothing beats Ilulisat. It is truly remarkable. Um, so this, this glacier just keeps carving out these icebergs. I, I I could get into the math of it. I don't know it off by heart, but the amount of ice that it's chugging out of this fjord is just insane. And it all comes out into that harbor and it flows north up the coast of Greenland, then down on the Canadian side and eventually years later heads down to Newfoundland. So when you see those pictures on Facebook of those huge there are some pretty funny ones recently in the news, uh, but there's huge icebergs that are coming down uh, to Newfoundland. That's where they're born from. They're coming out of this glacier here in Alulasat. Um, so that's pretty incredible. Um, let's take a look at the photos of it because I think that really uh, sums up. So in the distance, you're seeing the ice there. So uh, in the town of Alulasat, it, it, it branches out into this incredible boardwalk that you walk along and it's just stunning as you wind around, but it's also very accessible, which is nice. It's not a, a rough hike by any means. 
and you can wander along and look at how big this ice starts getting as as you start walking along. And then there's quite a few viewpoints. There's lots of hiking in this um, area. There's also a new um, interpretation center that they have here that you can visit. Um, but getting out to the viewpoints is where you want to be because you're going to get views like this, where you just in, all of a sudden seem incredibly puny next to all of this ice. And this just goes on and on and on, um, just just full of ice. And you'll hear them breaking off and like, look at how much ice there is. It just goes on forever. This is actually a panoramic photo that I had to wedge down in order to get it onto my PowerPoint slide. It just goes on forever and ever. And this is one of those stops where you want to have that minute to yourself, because if you're really, really quiet, you can hear the ice breaking and snapping and bubbling and floating around. And it's also a great area for humpback whales. So if you listen really closely, sometimes you'll hear the blows coming up through the ice. And it's really remarkable to see this amount of ice moving. Look how happy she is looking at all that ice. Incredibly happy. That's going to be you out on the lookout in Alulasat. So then we also want to experience the ice in different ways. So we want to see it on land because that's how you get that epic overarching bird's eye view. But we also want to see it by zodiacs. This is why the zodiacs are so, so key to expedition travel. We get to go out and have experiences um, in different ways and get different perspective. Like I said, humpbacks are commonly found here in Alulasat. Um, so especially in the zodiacs when we're out there, that's when we commonly see them. But you got to keep an ear and an eye out uh, for those whales. We'll all be on the lookout. That's pretty much the, the purpose of us getting out in those zodiacs. Aside from the ice, it's, it's the whales that we're looking for here. And we usually have pretty good luck. So this is the harbor of Alulasat. Uh, so it's not all about the, the glacier. I'm sure the uh, the people who live in Alulasat probably get so annoyed their, their town always gets overlooked because we're all so focused on all that ice that's just outside of town. But the, the community itself is actually really wonderful. There's, there's great shopping to do here. You can tell that their industry is clearly fishing. Um, their harbor is always this full. I've never seen it any less full. Um, and our ship will be docked out or sorry, anchored out um, a bit further out of town and we'll bring our Zodiacs in and, and get on one of these uh, floating docks that we'll take into town. Um, there's the ship out there. Um, I love the colors of the houses of Greenland, um, such a characteristic um, of this beautiful place. And like I said, there's lots to do here. There's there's museums and tons of shopping if you're wanting uh, to buy some local jewelry. Um, if you wanted to try some local food, they have a very good uh, muskox burger at the cafe here. Um, so it's also a great place to, to do some retail therapy if you're into that. So the next thing is the Davis Strait. So I, I already touched on this, so I won't go too into it. But I wanted to mention that it doesn't have um, that same personality of the uh, of the Drake Passage. It's typically very calm. It's it is a one one day at sea that's needed to get from Greenland over to Canada. Um, but this is a really important voyage for some people. Um, if you're into that that history of the Davis Strait and finding the Northwest Passage, the Davis Strait took a, uh, you know, it was a very important part uh, to that. So going through here is, is very special. And the day on board isn't um, boring at all. We will keep you so, so busy all day on your day at sea with lots of different workshops, um, lectures, different things happening on board, different events. Um, so a few examples that we have here, we have, um, James Raffin, he's leading a knot tying uh, workshop here. Everyone's trying to learn their knots. Uh, we have painting happening over here. Um, these ladies here, I believe they're beading, if I remember correctly. Heather, um, she is from Labrador, she's from Maine, and she uh, does uh, beading jewelry. She creates earrings and different things. So uh, that's a very common thing that we'll do on board. We'll have our, our Inuit staff teach us some beading and, and that's something that you can take home with you if you participate in those workshops is uh, potentially a pair of earrings or, or a necklace, whatever you make. And then over here we have Deanna Spitzer. Um, she is using her scope out on deck. She's a marine biologist. She is absolutely incredible at what she does um, and incredibly personable. And so she might lead or someone else might lead um, a scope workshop. We're out on deck being um, 
interactive with the different scopes that we have on board and also the binoculars, learning how to use them properly, uh, what you're looking for, um, and hopefully spotting some things out there as well that Deanna can interpret for you. And the Davis Strait has lots of ice. Um, it's a huge area for ice. Like I said, that ice is pumping out of Alulasat and heading its way down. So we do encounter lots of ice coming down from there, coming down from the north, coming, getting pushed out of the Northwest Passage. Um, and so this is a great day for wildlife. Wildlife it is where the ice is. Um, so we'll cruise through here. Like I said, our ship is ice class. So something like this is, is not a problem for us to be near or to hit. Um, so that's a really unique experience being able to go through such heavy ice um, and hopefully seeing some wildlife. We commonly see polar bears um, on the ice in the middle of Baffin Bay, which is just incredible. We had the most bizarre experience when we were going through the Davis Strait last year on this trip, um, where we saw a mama and two cubs out on the ice. So that was just very special. Kind of came out of the fog, out of nowhere. It was beautiful. So the next biggest highlight on this trip is Beachy Island. So this is a big one for the history buffs in the room. Uh, Beachy Island is um, where the graves are found from Franklin's failed expeditions. There are three members and buried here, and then one person who attempted to find them years later is also buried here. So there's the gravestones that you'll get to visit. Um, it's a very barren landscape. You can just like look at how flat and gray and brown it is here. You can only imagine what this must have been like for those explorers showing up in their wooden ship with their leather boots um, and finding this place and overwintering here, I believe, for two winters. Um, Again, a, a place where you want to take a moment to really take in where in the world you are at that moment. Northumberland House is also on Beachy Island. Um, so this is where messages were left in a cairn um, for different explorers to find. Um, I believe that's this over here. And then this is the uh, remains of Northumberland House. So that's something else that you'll get to visit. And we'll, of course, have our historians and our archaeologists there to be interpreting what um, what it could have looked like and what it would have been used for. There's a better photo of it from the ground, our ship parked out there. Lots of different things. You have to be very careful around these sites and we'll make sure that the experts explain to you how to how to behave around archaeological sites like this. So before we actually get to Beachy, um, what we have to do after the Davis Strait is we have to go in through Talarutiup Amunga. So that is this body of water here. Beachy is right around here. Sorry, no, nope, Beachy's here. And we will come in here and spend a few days looking for wildlife around Devon Island. Um, so this is a national marine conservation area, uh, very recently has been uh, named so. And um, we're gonna have our eyes out for all different types of wildlife in here. And we're very opportunistic in nature um, um, for these type of experiences. That's the beauty of having a small expedition vessel. Uh, we can kind of go where, where the wind takes us. So if there's an incredible viewing of some polar bears on land or on ice, um, or maybe an incredible viewing of a pod of whales going through, we can uh, choose to take advantage of that opportunity and we can stick around uh, with our ship. Maybe we'll hop out on the Zodiacs, uh, whatever the best viewing is going to be and whatever is the most ethical in the moment there. Um, so there's an, uh, what's called the Arctic Big Five. Um, I, I believe most people are familiar with it. Um, so one of those is walrus. They're also referred to as tooth walkers in the north um, because of obvious reasons. Um, very, very smelly creature. Everyone says you smell them before you see them. Um, so we'll be on the lookout for these in Talarutia Famanga. Muskox, we are more likely to see these over on the Greenland coast. Uh, so we'll keep an eye out for these, but they are considered part of the Arctic Big Five. Muskoxen, look at that cute little baby there. Narwhal, the very elusive unicorn of the sea. These are very skittish uh, hunted uh, animals. So the chances of seeing them by ship are low. I don't like to sell people on the idea of coming to the north just to see narwhal. Um, it has happened. I've seen them myself from the ship. Uh, it is something that happens, but it, it's good to be aware that they, they are very elusive. Um, they've been hunted for many, many years. And um, the, the sound of the ship is um, a bit concerning to them. 
Uh, we often see these off the coast of Mitamatalik, which is um, uh, within Talarutia Pamanga, and I'm going to talk about that community in just a second. Um, but a very incredible and rare creature to see is the narwhal. I have another picture of a walrus in here. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Here's another picture of a walrus on ice. <laughs> And beluga, uh, incredibly friendly canaries of the sea, they call them, another uh, animal in the Arctic Big Five. Um, we see these quite commonly in Talarutia Pamanga. They come through in really big pods. They're very social creatures. Um, and they're very, very easy to see because of their, their white coloring. And then, of course, on the topic of white coloring, we have the polar bear. I think that goes without saying that they are part of the Arctic Big Five and a huge, huge highlight for people to see these bears. So the community that I just referenced there, Mitzmatalik, um, this is the main Canadian um, Inuit community that we're going to go into on the high Arctic adventure. Um, so this is a, a recreated sod house here that we're looking at, at this photo. And then um, just across the pond there is, um, I believe it's called Sermalik uh, National Park. Um, beautiful, beautiful views from this community. And it's always such a warm welcome. But look at that view of the National Park just across the water here from the community. They get to look at this all day. I'm incredibly jealous. Um, that's not quite what I'm looking out at here uh, with Lake Ontario. Um, but we'll go out in the town, wander around. There, it's a very small community, um, but there are a few shops. You'll see people buzzing around on ATVs, going different places. They'll stop and, and talk with you. There's lots of engagement that happens here. Uh, the community is always very excited uh, to see us. Just a few more pictures of the town here. You can see it's very small. Um, there is a museum here, a bit of an interpretation center. It has a gift shop as well in there for some more retail therapy if you didn't get enough on the Greenland side. Um, but the interpretation center is pretty impressive here for the size of the town. Very educational. Um, and our guides will be there as well to, to talk about a few different things. But you can kind of wander independently or with the Wild Women group um, and, and check that out. And then what we'll do at the end of the day, after everyone has gone through um, with our local guides through town and checked out the different highlights of town, uh, the community comes together and they do this beautiful ceremony and welcome for us. They'll play traditional games. They'll sing songs. They'll do throat singing. Like you can see here, the kids get up there. Um, it's a big community get together. Tons of people get involved um, and, and they'll bring you up too. they're going to be encouraging people to get up there and try the games with them. I will warn you that most Inuit uh, traditional games involve pain. Um, so <laughs> that is something to be aware of before you start getting up there and participating. But it is a ton of fun and I am sure that they will go easy on you. And it's least notable feature, least notable, but for us Canadians, um, this is a fun fact for us. So I always have to bring it up when I talk about Mitz Matalik. It is home to the world's most northernly Tim Hortons. So you can grab your double-double uh, in Pond Inlet, Mitz Matalik, way up north. And that brings me to reaching 74 degrees north. So this trip will end in Resolute. And while we don't do too much programming here, this really is just our way of getting home. You are able to say that you've reached that degree. So I know lots of you in this room were with us on the Antarctic voyage. Um, depending on the one that you were on, um, you reached fairly far south. I believe mine. Julianne, do you remember how far south we made it? I think it was 76. I think so. 76 degrees south. Yeah. So if you were there with us on that trip, um, you can now make it up to 74 degrees north, which is um, huge to check that off of your list. And congratulations if you do it. So that brings me to charter flights. Um, so I just referenced that we get off the boat there in Resolute. So I just wanted to talk for a minute um, about the, the, the logistics of this. So for the 2023 sailing, which is the one that I, I'm talking about specifically here, uh, it leaves on July 25th, and we will fly you from Toronto to Kangaroo Shwak, Greenland, and that's where we will board the ship, and then we'll start sailing north. 
At the end of the trip in Resolute, we will disembark the vessel and we'll get on another charter flight. Again, this is what Adventure Canada takes care of. You don't need to worry about these flights. We book them for you and it's only our guests on board. So we'll get off the ship in Resolute and we'll board another flight that takes us to Ottawa. So this trip starts in Toronto with a flight to Kangalushuak, Greenland, and then ends in Resolute with a flight to Ottawa. So here's another look at the map. Maybe that will help better explain those flights going into Kangalushuak, heading further north for 12 days on the boat, ending in Resolute there and flying home uh, to Ottawa. So we do have some specials on right now that you might wanna take advantage of. So if you're looking to join us this summer, which I highly encourage you to, we've, we've all been cooped up for so many years now, it, it's time to get back out there and, and enjoy some adventure. Um, and what an incredible place to choose to do post pandemic is, is the Arctic, getting out into your own backyard if you're a Canadian. Uh, in 2023, you can book that High Arctic Explorer with a 15% discount if you book before May 17th. So there's another week to go on that promotion. Or if you're wanting to wait another year and you want to come with the Wild Women in 2024, there is a 15% uh, discount on those 2024 expeditions until May 31st. So a couple of more weeks on that one there. Um, and Megan did reference this at the beginning, but we encourage solo travel travel on our ships. Uh, we do have free single supplements available. So if you are wanting to come with the wild women, but you're not necessarily too keen on sharing with someone, no worries there. Reach out to them. Let them know you're a solo traveler and you'd like to have a private cabin to yourself. Um, and we will take a look into the availability there. There's about, um, I believe, five different cabin categories uh, that offer that free single supplement. So we can take a look into that. Just reach out to, to the wild women there. I think that that's it for me. I will pass it over to Megan. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks, Brenna. Very inspiring. <laughs> um, we do have a couple questions. So if anybody else has more questions, please add them <clears> into <throat> the Q&A box. But um, one, maybe Franny, maybe this one's for you. Somebody asked about um, the fact that we're women owned and directed um, and wondering if there's any men allowed. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think you could talk about what it's like to be a, our, our group of wild women, which are only women <laughs> um, in a group, in a bigger group that is everyone that's on board. How does that work? And what does that look like for, for our special groups? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Megan. Uh, so we are a small group of wild women within a larger Adventure Canada group. Uh, typically, there's anywhere from 150 to 200 passengers on the ship, and that will include um, some men. Um, but we do really stick with wild women. We we try and sit together during lectures and the re daily recap. And then at meals, we always have our wild women exclusive um, dining tables where we really meet um, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's a great time to connect and kind of debrief and connect over the day because sometimes we'll on excursions be experiencing different things but it's a great place to come back to um if it's a zodiac cruise we try as as um, much as possible to be women exclusive zodiac cruises um if it can be coordinated and facilitated um and that's what that dynamic looks like on the ship awesome thanks um, I have another question here about luggage, specifically on the charter flight, but mm -hmm. so maybe we can touch on that, what people can bring. And then also just what is traveling in the Arctic like for packing wise for August? Mm -hmm. These people are pretty dressed up. I know you're going to give us jackets. So what do people need to know? What do we need to bring? How cold does it get? And how much can we bring on board? Mm -hmm. Brady, did you want me to take that or did you want to speak to it? Sure, you can you can take that one, and if yeah. there's something missing, I can brush over. But you got this. <laughs> Thanks for your support. <laughs> so, in the Arctic, it is a little bit warmer than you would necessarily expect, and what we say is layer, layer, layer. So we will provide you with a waterproof uh, jacket as a shell. It's not insulated. So what you want to do is have um, typically some wool layers. Um, you'll want to have maybe a fleece sweater. 
Um, but layering really is the key to that. So on a typical day on the high Arctic Explorer, when we're traveling at the end of July, early August, we're going to get warm days, especially on the Greenland side. It is not uncommon end of July, early August for me to be wearing a T-shirt if I'm on the Greenland side. The second you switch over to the Canadian side, the temperature usually drops. Um, but you're looking at anywhere between 5 to 10, maybe 15 on the Greenland side. Uh, degrees Celsius. So it's still fairly warm. Um, but if you're out on deck and and we're sailing, it's going to be breezy. So you're going to want your jacket. Uh, you're going to want a couple of layers. You're definitely going to want a hat, um, a, a good pair of waterproof gloves. And mandatory is uh, waterproof pants because when we get onto the Zodiacs, there is a high probability that you're going to get a little bit of splash. It's all part of the fun. Don't worry about it. But that's why you need to have um, those waterproof uh, layers on top of what you're wearing. A um, couple pairs of active pants for out doing your hiking. Um, you probably won't wear shorts. It's not very buggy, um, but you will be stripping layers as you start hiking. Normally I bundle up, get in the Zodiacs, it's a little bit cooler, and then I get to land. I have my waterproof day bag and maybe I'll take off my, my fleece um, over shirt and, and I'll just wear my two wools underneath of my waterproof jacket. And maybe I'll take my waterproof pants off as well and put them in my in my bag. Um, we do provide rubber boots for getting in and out of those Zodiacs because you will be stepping into water. A lot of these places do not have docks. Um, so we'll we'll provide those for you. We'll get sized on the first day. Um, but you might want a pair of hikers, especially if you're a keen hiker and you're going to go out on those, you know, like long eight kilometers, 10 kilometers hikes. Um, you're going to want a good pair of, of hiking boots. You don't want to be rolling an ankle out there. Um, so you can always leave your rubber boots along with your life jacket right there at the landing site. We always have people there watching it. It'll have your name on it uh, for collection later. Um, but a pair of hiking boots would be good, too. Um, and then when it comes to the allowances, Lauren, stop me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 30 kilograms total, 10 for your carry on and 20 for your checked luggage. That sounds about right. It's essentially the same guidelines as any regular kind of commercial flight. Right. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Excellent. Um, there's another question about our groups. Um, so this question is how many women will be in our group? Um, Franny, maybe you can talk about that. And also the fact that we have a wild woman host on our trips as well. Yeah, so the group size really depends on a few different factors. The main one being how many women sign up. Um, our trips, our, our uh, Arctic trips have ranged from anywhere from 12 women all the way up to about 40 women. So the group size really varies. Um, and depending on the size of the group, there'll, there will also, there will always be a wild woman host, but if there's more, um, more get more wild women guests, then there'll be more hosts to help facilitate that group dynamic and experience. Um, and the host really works to facilitate those group experiences. So eating meals together, as well as um, sometimes there's bespoke exclusive um, workshops or kind of like lectures from some of the Inuit um, cultural educators um, and you have those hosts as kind of like your go-to, um, that you can ask questions, kind of like get the inside scoop from, um, yeah, so that's a little bit about that role. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there is another question here, uh, well, maybe going back to the question about the, the Drake passage, but I'll just a about seasickness and for someone who's never been on a ship or on a cruise before any tips for seasickness and then Absolutely. also is there a medical facility on board and what does that look like in a just in case situation just in case for sure so we do have a medical facility on board uh, what we have is an on the ground medic and then we also have a doctor on board um, so you can visit that infirmary if you needed to for for whatever reason whether whatever that might be, if it's seasickness or something else is going on, maybe you unfortunately had a fall or something like that, there is a doctor available on board. And then we have an on the ground medic who is going to go out on excursions with you. So you can always kind of rest assured that um, medical is always nearby, whether you're on board or on land. Um, seasickness. So 
I wouldn't worry too, too, too much about it. Our ship is very stable. She's heavy. She's ice class. Um, so she's a heavy vessel and she has two stabilizers on either side of her. Um, so she does handle herself really, really well in rough weather. And like I said, there's really just that one day where you might experience some type of swell. Um, like the average going through that body of water in my experience has been two meters two meter swells. Um, that's that's really not bad at all. Uh, when you go through the Drake, you can expect something like eight meter swells. Um, so two meters is, is a breeze, especially when you've got a ship with stabilizers on it. Um, if you're worried about the seasickness, you have the doctor there. If you needed to get, um, you know, an extra boost of meds, we'll call it, um, <laughs> that doctor has that shot available to you on board. Um, and they also have the patches if you needed that. I wouldn't rely on the doctor. You do have to pay for these services with the doctor <clears throat> in US dollar. Um, so if you can bring the patches up with you, that's definitely best case scenario. Bring the medication, bring the gravel just in case. Book yourself into a cabin that's on a low deck. You want to be on deck four four or deck five. I wouldn't go any higher than deck five if you're worried about that seasickness um, and get yourself wedged in there in, in the midship area if you're really, really concerned about it. But those are the two decks you want to be on. And everyone on board is going to uh, cheer you through any sickness that you might potentially feel. Um, the, the rule of thumb is uh, look at the horizon if you're feeling something, and that will usually help quite a bit. Get out, get some fresh air, don't drink too much liquids, Unfortunately, do not drink alcohol during those days. Um, there's lots of ways to avoid seasickness. I would never let that stop you from having an experience like this. Excellent, thanks. Uh, there was a question here about, uh, are we spending any time in Resolute on the last day? Is there hmm. time to stay a little bit or are we off right away? It depends on how the day goes. Um, there is the potential that we would do a town tour, um, just a brief kind of maybe um, using buses going through the town. It is very small. It really truly is mostly an airport um, and then some industry up there. So there is the potential that we'll get out, maybe walk or uh, use buses to go around town. But the main purpose of that day really is to get us to the airport. Um, so I don't want to promise anything there. Um, it's an added bonus if you can get around town for a bit. Um, but the primary focus on that day is just to get to the airport and get on those charter flights. Great. Um, just a quick one about the never ending COVID requirements. Uh, are we yeah. still talking about uh, COVID tests and what does that look like when you're yeah. on board? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We're all still thinking about COVID. It hasn't disappeared. Um, so with COVID on board in the 2023 season specifically, um, there is not a mask mandate, but there is a vaccination mandate. So you do need to have a double vaccination to travel with Adventure Canada this year. Um, masks are um, recommended if you feel that you would like to use them, um, but they are not mandatory. And it's a very inclusive environment that we'll be curating on board. Some people will use masks. Some people won't. It's totally up to you what you feel most comfortable with. Um, if you were feeling symptoms of COVID, stuffy nose, um, but you're testing negative, we're still going to ask that you do wear a mask just so you don't spread anything. Um, it's not just COVID that gets on these ships. It's other things, too. Um, so if you are feeling a little symptomatic, we might ask you to put a mask on. Um, and then if you were to test positive uh, for COVID-19 on board, unfortunately, there is a five day uh, mandatory quarantine that you would need to need to do in your cabin. And are we requiring tests before getting on board? Oh, sorry. Tests. No. Right, Lauren? No. No tests this year. No tests. Vaccine. No. Good. Good. <laughs> Uh, just one last one before we sign off. There is a question about if we know, and maybe we don't know at this stage, but are there any special guests on board? I think we know that mm -hmm. Margaret Hood has traveled on some of the Adventure Canada trips. <laughs> any musical or literary guests that we know of? <laughs> It is true. Margaret Atwood does frequently travel with Adventure Canada. She's a good friend of the family. Unfortunately, she is not on this trip. Um, there isn't a special guest per se on the High Arctic trip, but I would consider all of our expedition staff to be special guests because you're going to get on there and you're going to be floored by what these people do. They are truly remarkable superhumans. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. That was so informative and inspiring. 
I think that we are all excited to jump on this trip. If we haven't booked, make sure where everyone is calling Julianne soon to get booked. Yeah. So as Brenna said, we do still have space on the 2023 departure, uh, but we're also planning well ahead for next summer. And those trips are all live on our website as well. So jump on there and take a look at what's available for next year. We have a few options for exploring the Arctic. Um, if you are interested in seeing polar bears in the north, but aren't a big fan of ships, I also want to mention that we have our polar bear safari also has space on it available on the 4th of November of this year uh, in Churchill, Manitoba, which is an amazing experience and getting to see polar bears from a tundra buggy instead of from a ship or do both and get to see polar bears <laughs> from all different angles. Um, but if you have any questions or if there's anything we didn't get to today, please do reach out to us at adventure at wildwomenexpeditions.com or give us a call. Um, and you can and you can pick Julianne's brain about everything. She was on this ship last week, we went to Antarctica on this ship as well. So she is a wonder woman who can answer all your questions. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to welcome you on board. And a huge thanks to you, Franny and Brenna and Lauren and Julia for joining. This has been very informative. Thanks for having us. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Take care, everyone. We'll see you on board this summer. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Bye.